Good afternoon. And buenas tardes. I'm Anthea Hartig, the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the National Museum of American History at your Smithsonian Institution. And as we celebrate the last day of Women's History Month, I want to welcome you to this program, Trailblazing Women in Entertainment. As the museum's first woman director, it gives me both professional and personal pleasure to host this conversation today. I'm here in Northern California with family on the traditional lands of the Ohlone. And wherever you are, let us acknowledge and give our respects to Native peoples for the opportunity to work and live in their territories. And let us also pause and begin and acknowledge this moment of intersecting crises as we've survived now into the second year of a global pandemic the clash of viral, racial, economic, climate, political crises continue to plague us, but yet I think we all see and feel hope, both in our veins through the vaccine uh, and in our hearts. Our sympathies, especially right now, to those who are suffering in the Asian American and Asian Pacific Islander communities. At your National Museum of American History, our mission is to empower people to create a just and compassionate future by exploring, preserving, and sharing the complexities of our past. And we see, we see public history as a multifaceted tool. Learning history helps people understand that today's world is not inevitable, but the result of a myriad of choices and actions made by individuals and communities across time. Our collections are vast and we're working to make sure that objects, people, and stories we share accurately reflect the diversity of our nation through all of our content. One of the major exhibitions we're working on is Entertainment Nation, a 20 year exhibition that will explore the power of entertainment to help shape our nation and bring about social and historic change. Entertainment like film, television, sports, theater, music can bring our nation together and it can foster important conversations by causing us to dig deeper and think differently. I encourage you to stay tuned for future information about the exhibition, but today I'm thrilled that we have three very esteemed guests who are deeply impressive women and all have contributed their own oral histories to our Smithsonian National Entertainment Collection through our American Scene Project. It's an honor to introduce them all to you now. As they miraculously appear on the screen together. Uh, first, uh, DG Pritzker, the founder and CEO of Madison Wells. Madison Wells develops, produces, and funds projects in the film, television, and theater spaces. And some of Madison Wells' notable projects include Edward Norton's Motherless Brooklyn, the movie 21 Bridges starring Chadwick Bosman, the National Geographic's Emmy Award-winning anthology series Genius, which this season features Aretha Franklin. The company also supports projects in a number of different entertainment mediums, including theater, virtual reality, gaming, and graphic novels. It's a delight to welcome back to one of my favorites on my Zoom screen, um, Abby Raven. Abby is Chairman Emeritus of a &E Networks. Abby began her career as a production assistant and rose through the ranks to become the second CEO and first chairman in a &E Networks history. She's one of the original founders of the History Channel brand and among her many accolades under her leadership, Lifetime established itself as a leading network brand for women. We are also deeply honored to have Abby as our current chair of the National Museum of American History's Board of Advisors. Thank you, Abby. Anna Devere Smith, a playwright, a professor, an actress, and an author, and an inspiration. Anna is credited with creating a new form of theater based on interviews that usually center around social problems or moments of crisis. Her most recent play, Notes from the Field, looks at vulnerability of youth, inequality, and the criminal justice system, as well as contemporary activism. She'll appear in Shonda Rhimes' upcoming miniseries and was part of the cast of The West Wing, 
and Nurse Jackie, among many others. As the founding director of the Institute of the Arts and Civic Dialogue in New York at New York University, um, she's also a professor there at the Tisch School of the Arts. Her most recent play and film, Notes from the Field, looks at the vulnerability of youth and equality of the criminal justice system as, as it blends with contemporary activism. Welcome to all three of you. I'm so looking forward uh, to our conversation today and to learning from all of you. So let's start about, um, I'd like to ask about your current work and uh, Gigi, I'm gonna start with, uh, with you, with Madison Wells. And I'd like to show our audience a brief video clip uh, from your current work. Rebellion will get you nowhere in life. My hands are a little dirty. So am I. Having way too much fun. It's making everyone uncomfortable. I was trying to figure out if the life that I picked for myself is even the one that I want. You may never figure that out. Madison Wells recently codified its mission, as you know, Gigi, to tell the stories for, by, and about badass women, as well as people who love pushing boundaries. Could you share with us a bit on what led you to articulate this as your objective, uh, which is a wonderful mission statement that we're on, and how you carry out that work? Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor to be with this wonderful group of women. Um, so I grew up um, in a very male family. I have three older brothers. I have nine nephews. Uh, it was competitive and it was a lot of dude culture. Um, and so um, I felt very much I had to strike out on my own and compete. Um, and then as the universe does, it pulls its strings in funny ways and gave me three daughters. Um, and so I have been on a journey for the last 25 years, um, both in my work and in my personal life, um, really looking at kind of um, that change for myself and for our company. And I think that we have evolved to a place where that mission statement um, really rings true for me. Um, and is something that everyone in the company has been able to and wants to rally behind. Uh, and we find ourselves um, drawn to um, stories that women are telling, stories that people who haven't been able to tell their stories are telling. And the good news is we're at a moment in time where that's actually what people, um, so it's exciting. That's wonderful. Um, I, I, I love the, uh, the universe flipping genders on you. I think that's, that's great. Um, it did indeed. It did indeed. And we're all the better for it. I do hear a lot of different sounds in my ears. Hold on just a second. I'm going to try and change my sound. Um, can you still hear me? OK. Yes. 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 Wonderful. OK. Uh, Abby. Um, as we think about the history of women in entertainment, you've had such a long and incredible history. Um, I'd like to take a look at some of your uh, incredible work at the a and &E Networks, if we can tee up that reel. I have a choice to be good, or I have a choice to be great. Every day I wake up and I choose to be great. That's why we're here. To tell stories, our stories, like no other one. Yes! I'm back in the shop. How cool is that? 
some of the greatest stories in history. Bam! Didn't expect that, okay. I want my story to be heard. To be my own woman. We don't do easy, we do excellent. Just what you need. Here we go. Let the games begin. It's unfiltered. Bringing you closer than ever. It's time to answer the call. You just don't know what's going to happen. Just sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. How you like us now? That's awesome. Um, I think we're having some of the best sizzle reel uh, around. Abby, what was it like to launch a brand new television channel as a woman in leadership? Um, what what projects inspire you or inspired you then and continue to inspire you as chairman emeritus or emerita? Well, um, I had a, the good fortune of having um, experience launching uh, A&E when it first started, um, but I was a junior person not in charge um, when we launched uh, that network, but had that experience. But launching you know, a new channel like History was an incredible opportunity, um, both exciting um, and risky. Um, you know, it was an incredible challenge to devise a network from scratch, fill it with compelling programming. Um, and I always thought of myself, you know, asked a little bit about what it was like as a woman too. You know, I thought of myself first as a creator and a leader in launching those networks. I didn't quite focus on, on being a woman, even though I was reminded of it. Um, early on, there was a trade article about um, the launch of the History Channel and it and it said a chick runs history um, and that was because you know it was a network that was focused on a demographic um, of men and so um, I just sort of ignored it focused on the work and um, but launching that network, we had to face a lot of obstacles, a lot of competition, um, and most of all, combat, and something that I know, Anthea, you deal with all the time, um, saying that history is not just a dull subject. It's not as, you know, a subject that you just studied social studies in, in high school, but, of, you know, compelling stories, amazing stories, stories you can't make up. Um, so, in the initial you know, period, there was a lot of naysayers saying nobody's gonna watch a channel about history. And so we had to fight that um, in, our, in our launch. Um, and what we found is that there was a huge hunger for entertaining historical stories, taking historical stories, making them entertaining and compelling. Um, and I think, you know, what was exciting for us is that it helped us really look at um, how people were so attracted to these stories and that it could help them navigate through life for young people to understand um, more about their past. Um, and um, it was what was interesting, it really spurred on a lot of com competitors. Um, there was a huge wave of historical documentaries um, in that early period. Um, but I'm extraordinarily proud of, of what we accomplished and, um, and the team there today, um, the management team and uh, the creative team is just doing a phenomenal job and at things that I'm excited about. I'm blown away by uh, mini series coming up um, with Doris Burns Goodwin, um, more miniseries about presidents. She's she's working on one with Leonardo DiCaprio about Theodore Roosevelt um, and one on about her favorite topic, which is Lincoln. Um, and there'll be a lot of surprising information in that. Um, I'm also very excited about a project that we started when I was still at the History Channel and is continuing today, which is being sort of the archivists of 9-11 and having been the head of a 
History Channel, During 9-11, A New Yorker, Friends at the World Trade Center, um, Family at the World Trade Center. Um, it's very important to me personally. Um, and as we come upon the 20th anniversary, amazing documentaries in the works um, uh, showing some new information, taking original uh, archival video, looking at that, um, and as well as looking, re-looking at the four flights. There's not been a documentary that has combined uh, stories about all four flights in one documentary and the amazing um, surprises, of coincidences, um, things that really relate to each other, um, which is very compelling. So there's a lot on the docket. A lot, a lot going on still. Yeah. yeah. And many more stories to tell. Uh, thank you. Thank you for weaving all of that together, too, uh, especially with the ongoing work of, of History Channel. Um, and last but certainly not least, Anna, we know you so well from TV and, and, um, and film. I was honored to see your work as a uh, in Los Angeles, which uh, changed my life, no, uh, no exaggeration. Um, and some of your projects um, are, are in our National Entertainment Collection, including the West Wing. So let's play a little bit of the West Wing, um, which my, I want to know, but you know, my 20 year and 21 year old sons, of course, are now, they're everyone's rediscovering the West Wing. So you're famous all over again, uh, especially in our household. So. So I have a large project first. called On the Road, A Search for American Character. My grandfather told me when I was a girl that if you say a word often enough, it becomes you. So for a very long time, I've been trying to become America, sort of word for word, and I've made about 18 plays this way. Uh, some of your audience will remember my plays about the Crown Heights riots and the Los sure. Angeles yeah. riots. Fires in the and Mirror. Also Fires in the Mirror, Twilight at Los Angeles, and um, Let Me Down Easy about health care. When asked about bilingual education, who said, if the English language is good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for everybody. I said, I am a fool for every patient who comes on this unit. I want you to know that this is the place that you can come to recall to life in whatever fashion you have the person we sent on. Everybody said it should have killed me. And they didn't even knock me out. So it's in that vein that I'm interviewing people, teachers, cops, kids, parents, about what's going on in schools and trying to think about ways with their help of how we can turn this all around. Open your eyes. It is impossible to talk about the criminal justice system without talking about education. Prison don't do nothing but make you a worse or worse person. You want to change, you got to do it by yourself. Even if I didn't make it down the pole, the statement would still be made. It's a movement, and it's not going to stop. Most teenagers get incarcerated, all because of your mouth. It's prison or death. <laughs> we going to keep demanding justice. A message to black America. Don't expect nobody to open the door for you. Can't wait for the leaders to make it better. We have to make it better. Wow. Um, and I'm sorry, I misspoke. Those were obviously um, some clips from your remarkable efforts um, in the fields of inequality and discord documenting American communities uh, and some incredible highlights from notes from the field. So thank you for that. And could you, could you share with us a bit of, on the importance of bringing these stories to light through entertainment um, and through such remarkable modalities of your own um, artistry and then your next chapter um, of this project of focusing especially on, on girls and girlhood. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think from what Abby said, you know, we know um, that people want to learn. Uh, probably the nation of, of, uh, of uh, learners who, who, who would like to keep learning after they get out of school. Um, it usually tends to happen, I think, sometimes with people who are already fairly educated. But I think we're in a time now, especially with social media, that you know people want to know stuff. In my case, um, I wanted to use the theater as a way of convening people um, around social issues. And with my latest 
play Notes from the Field, um, I and the bass player who was on stage with me, the first time I really had another human being, my plays on stage with me, we stopped the show in the middle, uh, at least in some of the performances, uh, not New York, um, but in uh, in Cambridge uh, and in uh, Boston and also in San Francisco, Berkeley, uh, where we just stopped the play in the middle and we said, well, this play is about education. Uh, all of you in the audience know more than us. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to get in the way of uh, passive spectatorship. And we sent audiences every single night out into all over the theater in groups of 20 with um, uh, with facilitators to talk about their proximity to what came to be known as the school to prison pipeline. And, um, you know, that was an enormous experiment, but I would say that was me trying to actualize my purpose and my mission, which is to convene people who may not otherwise be together to be um, attracted to a problem through the elements that we use in art and entertainment, beauty, uh, surprise. You know, I always say, the first thing I say to the set designer is it has to be beautiful because the problem is so dark. So, I mean, both Gigi and Abby know uh, how we can attract attention. And so th that's what I wanted to, to do is to use uh, acting and um, to use my colleagues in the theater to bring attention to problems. Well, and you most certainly have and continue to do so in those really um, engaging and intersectional ways that the stopping kind of, especially that stop, stop, start motion and then going into audience and into community to bring forth ex shared experiences um, is just, it's, it's a, not only a beautiful act of art, but it's a beautiful act of activism. So um, throughout this, our dear audience, please, of course, um, submit questions. We'll have, we'll have time in the end. Um, and I'm going to ask some questions of all the panelists now. Um, as you've all witnessed the evolution of the entertainment industry um, throughout your careers, women have faced so much, um, everything from blatant sexism and harassment, uh, a, new, a number of reckonings, Time's Up, Me Too, um, and of course the ongoing social and political um, and uh, activism for racial uh, justice. Um, maybe start with you, Gigi. Share with us some of the biggest changes you've seen in your career um, in the industry as you contemplate your own and other women's uh, roles uh, and places in in the industry. Um, I think for me, it's um, I I similar to you, Abby. Um, I didn't early on think about myself as a woman in this industry necessarily. I just put my head down and did what I had to do. And often it was as the only woman in the room. Um, and that just was what it was. I think the thing for me that's so um, exciting about now, and maybe it's a, a part about getting older as well, is uh, I feel there's more openness and more camaraderie. I think maybe since the um, landscape is peppered with more women in different positions, there isn't that sense of fear uh, as being the motivating force for a lot of people, but it is, there's more of an ability to be open and collaborate. I think women don't mentor the same way guys do. And um, I know for me, when I was younger, I would have loved to have had a, a female mentor just wasn't really the way things worked in the early 80s. Um, but now it is, and there are. And I think it's, for me at least, I feel like a, a much more convivial, collaborative um, world. Uh, and also, you know, I'm surrounded in our company by much younger women, which is great and gives me a ton of energy and, and optimism, frankly. Um, so yeah, I see it changing a lot. And I see that they're in entertainment. There's different faces, there's different voices, there's different ways to tell stories. Uh, in my own um, you know, experience in our own company, we and I have morphed from really being a film-centered person and company to a very much a multi-platform um, medium agnostic environment, which has been great. Um, getting to know the world of gaming um, and virtual reality and how that's built and what those artists are experimenting with, um, as well as theater and live and immersive and all the other things we do. 
So, so I actually am very optimistic about the way the world looks from our, our piece of it. Yeah, so it's growth, mentorship, um, and then expanding into media, which I'd love to pick up on, on a bit later. Um, uh, Abby or Anna, your thoughts kind of on the change, the changes that you've seen uh, in your careers? Well, you know, I agree with, with Gigi about the point about, you know, being often being the only one in the room and just sort of keep your head down and do the work um, has always been my philosophy. Um, you know, I grew up first in theater, but mostly in the cable industry. And the cable industry was a phenomenal place for women um, because it was a startup. You know, nobody knew what cable was. You know, everybody was just sort of figuring it out. And so women just started taking on different roles, you know, creating roles. Um, so there were a lot of women in production, a lot of women in programming, not as much in the business side. Um, and so I started on the, the production side and programming side, um, later moved more into business as I became the CEO. Um, and that's where I was more often the only woman in the room. Um, but it was a great place for women to, to start. And what we've seen is as those women matured, um, they started mentoring other women. Um, and then you started seeing more women run studios, run production companies, run networks. Um, and so I've been very encouraged about that. Um, and, you know, I think that though we all have to make an effort to make sure that that continues. And I'm enormously proud of what Lifetime has done. Um, Lifetime has proven something, which is in the industry, which if you look at the statistics of how many in the, more in Hollywood where, you know, how many women writers there are, executive producers and all of that. We have changed the dynamic. We've started a program called Water Focus, um, which, which focused on bringing more women behind the camera. Um, and we've almost doubled the statistics in, in each category. It's remarkable. Um, and part of that is by giving women an opportunity um, where they might not have had it before. Some are a, a lot of very uh, proven actresses who said, you know, I really I wanted to direct. Um, and we gave them their first chance to do direct something. Um, Kira Cedric, uh, Angela Bassett, Eva Longoria, um, Jennifer Aniston directed their very first film for a lifetime um, because we gave them a chance. Um, and so I think that group of women now are going to give other women a chance to do it. Um, so I, I'm very encouraged. I, you know, it's still hard. It's still hard in the, in the C-suite, um, but I think we're going to make progress. No, thanks for the, the detailed optimism and that kind of playing it forward, right, and giving those opportunities. Um, Anna, what does it look like from uh, from your perspective in terms of changes you've seen, changes you want to see? Well, um, you know, when I first started, women were, for the most part, casting directors, uh, occasionally an agent, but not even that. Um, I remember the first movie, I think the first movie I was in was a movie called Dave. And um, I was surprised that when I went to get my makeup done, the person doing my makeup was a man who seemed more like a grip. And that was very interesting to me. It's like, I had to figure out, oh, it's because of the union, because that's not who I, you know, expected to be in makeup. You know, um, I also came around into this at a time that uh, there were changes afoot in culture in general. So, for example, when I went to acting school, all of the playwrights that we had to use to perform or in scene class were uh, white men. Right, uh, writing about the dilemmas of white men. And so I'm in that generation where uh, we were encouraged, if we were not white men, um, to, to, by the way, white straight men uh, who were writing about the dilemmas of white straight men. Um, and uh, so we were encouraged to bring new content to the table. So if it hadn't have been for that moment, which was sort of at the late 70s, we wouldn't have playwrights like Susan Laurie Parks, we wouldn't have George D. Wolf, we wouldn't have August Wilson, we wouldn't have Tony Kushner. So there was a kind of a sea change. So I, I don't think, for example, that we're really in an unprecedented moment. It's just to be conscious of how long the window will still stay open, where transformation can actually happen, right? Um, so, you know, now I would say for me, the biggest earthquake 
is having a chance to work uh, for Shonda Rhimes and in her company, where uh, obviously she has a lot of uh, resources and, and um, influence, but also so many of the people that as recently as Nurse Jackie, wasn't that long ago, although the women, women uh, for a while ran that show, but so many of the people around the table are women in authority. And I actually like it uh, a lot. I mean, Gigi, you said the word fear. I was like, you know, in Shondaland, I'm kind of like, well, where are these boys who usually look like they haven't slept or changed their things in um, 10 weeks? And, you know, so, and Ellen Pompeo recently in a variety uh, uh, interview said, you know, we have to work so long. We, do we really need to work these long hours? The only reason we're here so long is because men don't want to go home. And I'm finding that my students, even and particularly after the, the killing of George Floyd, really, you know, in places that in, in conservatories are really questioning how do we work? What do we have to work so hard that we look like? They want to question all of that. And so for me, it's a moment that is as much about questioning the cultures in which we work um, in, uh, in these industries. You know, we're, we shouldn't take ourselves so seriously. We're only saving lives by implication, not in real time. And so I think we could do this with a lot of humility. And, um, and to me, it's like as much about that. Like, why is there the fear? Why is it so hierarchical as it is about how many women, how many men, you know, how many trans, how many black, how many, you know, it's really right. what this book is. So really getting, that's beautifully said, really getting to the core, kind of the, the core, not just the core emotions, but the core situations that create our working environments, our gender assumptions, um, then how how we work, for whom do we work, and, um, and how does that continue? It is an incredible um, era now, I think, of that questioning, um, and really of representation. Um, as we think about it as historians, as you might guess, and curators, uh, there's a there's a kinship or um, around our Zoom table here or around our StreamYard uh, table here because we think about stories. What do we collect? Whose stories do we tell? Um, our Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative is foregrounding women in history these past couple of years. Um, but it, in entertainment, you get to determine whose stories are told and in what medium, to your great point, Gigi, incre increasingly in ex an expansive set of media, um, and Abby, you helped pioneer that too, especially with cable. Um, so what? share with me a bit on what goes into making those judgments. Um, whose voices do you honor? Who's, um, whose stories do you tell? I'll, I'll jump in with a, a quick anecdote. The, um, it was interesting, the, the evolution of the Genius series, um, which you mentioned Aretha being um, the seasons, this which season. was um, So that started when we, uh, my company, um, um, optioned the uh, Walter Isaacson book on Einstein. And uh, I was trying to develop it as a movie for the longest time. And I realized that there's a reason there hasn't been a great movie on Einstein, because his life is not a three act, two hour structure. And so when we opened it up and thought about episodic and television, it suddenly made more sense. And um, it was an amazing experience because basically it was all women. So National Geographic was um, women, Courtney Monroe and Carolyn Bernstein. We had Fox 21, which was a bunch of women. We had our company, which was women. And we had Imagine Films, which the executives were women. So it was all these women doing the quintessential Einstein story. And as we were going through the process, we kept saying, we want to do a woman. We have to have a woman genius. And so Einstein was the first one. And we pushed to have a woman be the second one. Second one was Picasso, definitely not a woman. Um, and so we all kept pushing and pushing. And what was fascinating was I think the powers that be wanted to have the third genius be a woman. The process of finding through history a woman who had been celebrated and could check the boxes that a distributor needed, global, you know, known for something, all these things, was unbelievably uh, complicated. And it really opened all of our eyes to exactly the point you make, which is whose stories got told? 
whose stories got elevated throughout history so that now we think of them as a genius or someone that we know and is celebrated. Um, happily, we were able to highlight Aretha, um, but it was an interesting process and it definitely was very eye-opening. Interesting. Uh, it, fascinating um, way to, to, to get into that. But, you know, uh, what we do in, in television is is really about serving our audiences. Um, and that's sort of that's really how you make your decisions. Um, in a lot of cases, um, you sort of step out of the box sometimes um, and see how far you can go. Um, we used to have an expression that people voted with their remotes um you know it, it was great you know you could have a fabulous story that was you know your passion project but if nobody was going to watch it um you weren't going to do the next project um so you know as a commercial business you know that's how you know we we tar we really spend time understanding our audiences and what they wanted, but also thinking outside the box, you know, and we thought outside the box a lot, especially in history and in lifetime and in any, and, and, and looking at new ways to, to shape a story. Um, and, and then also look at stories and say, where do they fit? Best, you know, just the way she, she does in her production company. You know, should this be a podcast? Should this be a short form? Should this be an independent film? Um, so, you know, as much as we look at diverse stories and and stories that have not been told, we have to make sure that we're crafting them for our audience. And you know, very often a little story that nobody ever heard of ends up being, you know, a ratings, you know, winner. Um, and so you have to make that leap. Um, and that's part of the, it's not a science of how you decide which ones to, you know, which stories to go after. Um, it's really an art um, and, you know, and it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, thanks, Abby. Anna, as a consummate storyteller, what are some of your thoughts? Well, I mean, it, you know, I'm, I'm not in that league. Um, first of all, I can't make decisions. To, I can make decisions about what I decide I'm going to work on in my theater. And there's only one criteria for me, which is that um, people have to want to scream the story from a mountaintop. And I just happen to be walking by. I'm not like a journalist. I don't coerce people. So, for example, I sent um, an assistant of mine down to do some advance, just sniffing around during her, right after Hurricane Katrina. And he called me up and he said, there's stories hanging off the of trees down here. So I packed my bag and I went there. And, you know, as a dramatist, I'm interested in, in um, catastrophe in that way, too, and in crisis. Because I find that when people are in crisis or they're coming out of crisis, that they talk in very um, fascinating ways. And that's, uh, I say, I'm trying to get people to sing to me. So they, they really speak in very unique ways. And for what I do, I need uh, speech that's like that. Um, you know, I have to say that I'm sure for there may be people on this Zoom who had this experience, but this is the first time that I got a script that I realized, I mean, you know, at a major network, at a major network uh, is going into production right now. Uh, I'd never heard of the writer. She had about a million followers in social media. <laughs> and so, Abby, she's doing, she has proved before she even gets to Hollywood that yes. she has an audience. And so, you know, I don't understand all the intricacies of it, but everything points to the fact that social media itself, uh, you know, people are making art and they're doing things and they're being seen and they're changing, they're changing the way it's working. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about that is, you know, you, you know, the traditional way of monitoring television is your ratings. And now it's, you know, how many tweets did that show get? Are they live tweeting during the show? Um, who's, who's, you know, tweeting? Uh, it's without question, you know, a marker for who's watching. It's a, it's a very interesting dynamic. Who's watching and therefore who's making. And I think that's what's going to make it more democratic and more diverse, really. Yeah. One of the aspects. You look at the, um, I don't know if you're familiar with what's been happening with the Ratatouille musical, which emerged from TikTok. And now, you know, literally, it's going to end up probably on Broadway, which is fascinating. And it came from crowdsourcing a bunch of people who loved Ratatouille 
and all started doing pieces of putting a show together. It's fascinating. Yeah. And, and I have a question, if I may be so uh, do this, Anthea, for you, which means how is the Smithsonian, which, you know, by its nature, uh, has to move slowly or maybe yeah, we can answer this. How are you going to keep up with all this? How are you going to think about archiving all this? That's a that's a great question. Um, and in a nod to uh, Coach John Wooden uh, and my UCLA Bruins, uh, to be quick but don't hurry, um, historians and curators wrestle with this, right? Because there's a there's a part of us that's incredibly conservative and we have to wait 50 years before something's important. We can't wait 50 years. We know 2020 was important. We know what's happening with the entertainment right, industry right now is important. And these intersections, right? And these kind of leapfroggings of, of impact and audience and Im importance. So we've um, we've long collected what we call a rapid response position, where we had collector, we had brave curators volunteer to go out on the National Mall on the 7th of January after the insurrection at the Capitol before they started cleaning up the mess uh, to collect uh, at that moment. Um, we're expanding our capacity to collect born digital materials because as you just pointed out, especially with Ratatouille and TikTok, I mean, Broadway, tracking all of this means we're collecting things that will never actually be a physical, uh, have a physical manifestation, right? There'll never be something in print or, or an object that we can collect. Um, we're also um, deeply, I think, sensitive to the intersections of, of this moment. When I mentioned the cascading crises, if you will, um, where, what objects, what moments, what productions, and for, um, for our big show, Entertainment Nation, um, how do we design a, a, a space, a 8,000 square foot space that continues to be able to spotlight stories and change um, with the conversation nationally? Um, uh, and then how do we bring in objects from our collection that resonate with objects we're collecting now? Uh, and so really to take a, a, a very kind of open, even vulnerable place um, and, and position when we think about the collection and we think about putting those objects together to tell stories that um, our audiences get to mix up in their own ways, right? Get to mix up online, get to mix up in a museum um, on multiple platforms. And so it's, it's an amazing time, I think, to, to, to lead the nation's museum, but also to think about the, especially women in entertainment, the risks that they've taken. Um, you know, we have, we have objects from Mae West, right, who had her own set of incredible challenges. We have uh, Phyllis Diller's joke set, um, which, uh, and um, of course, some of her fantastic, uh, um, uh, the incredible dresses like the one there in the middle. And um, we go back to Charlotte Cushman, um, an early stage actress who played both male and, and female roles. So we're trying to document like you all on, on this, um, uh, in this program have also taken risks right? You've, you've advanced causes that you're passionate about. You've, you've taken risks, um, as you said, Abby, in a, a whole startup medium, you know, like, um, uh, like cable. And uh, so we, we in the museum world, and I feel too, have to take those risks as well, to try and document this time. Right? So um, on risk, what um, you've all articulated um, some great uh, areas in which you've taken that risk. Um, and as we think about um, this major exhibition that we're working on, um, what stories do you wish we would tell about women in entertainment? <laughs> Abby's thought about this a lot. You get to go first, yeah. <laughs> Only because I've been exposed to having been being involved with the Smithsonian, know a little bit more about this. But, you know, I personally, you know, if I take my museum or a history hat off, you know, and just as, you know, an individual, I'd like to see more about the women that really 
were there at the beginning of each kind of uh, trend and exposure, some of whom we don't really know. You know, um, in the early 1900s, it's the, the women who created pageants in their small town, um, which was like the birth of, you know, live theater. Um, and, you know, we don't, we don't hear about those women um, or the, you know, or the women, not necessarily the big, you know, stars, but the people that were really there, the people that created, you know, um, hit movies or 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 or, or shows or or, or the, the writers behind those. So it's really I'm interested in the behind the scenes people, um, and would love to see more of that. That's great. What about you, Gigi or Anna? What would you like us to do? And then we have some great questions from the audience. You know, I think it's it's uh, you know about digging for what we don't know, right? As much as it is about who's out there that we haven't heard enough about. Um, you know, a friend of mine is very proud of the fact that he testified uh, against George Harrison uh, about a song about my sweet lord. Because he was at, and you know they were able to prove that it was actually a, a song called "He's So Fine." They would stolen the hit from uh, these women who had a song called "He's So Fine," right? So I mean, Abby, there was something that you said that made me think about, like you know, to what extent have men even been been proxies for women uh, in what they've created? So, uh, but I, you know, you're really in a position to dig up stuff that we don't know. That's what excites me about this week. Mm -hmm. is when I turn a page and it's something that I just don't have any consciousness about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Kind of playing archaeologist at the same time. Yeah. Gigi, any thoughts for us? Uh, you know, same as uh, Anna mentions, I think that it's the people we don't know. Um, you know, I, I uh, became involved with a documentary about a woman I had no idea about, a woman named Alice Guy Blaché who was first female director, um, worked for Gaumont, was a, uh, a turn of the century female director as hockey's were starting to happen. Nobody, you know, we know about the Lumiere brothers. Um, we know about, you know, some names from that era. She's been wiped off the face of history and is an absolutely fascinating a uh, woman who owned her own studio at a time when that absolutely didn't happen. So I think, Anna, to your point, it's it's who we don't know that we need to learn about. And that means that we can't only take success as a marker. You know, um, I can't remember the name of the film, but MoMA uh, completely redid a film, which was a, a black film done at a, at a moment when there was almost a black studio, and then it, it didn't happen. So it's like, what are the things that didn't happen? Because we can go back and try again. There are all kinds of reasons that things don't go forward, as you both know very well. Yeah, you know, one of the questions we have, thank you all um, so very much. A couple of the questions we have from our audience resonate with, with, with a couple of things we just shared. Um, one of one of them asks, um, are there first everyone thanks you for uh, for all that you've done. Um, one asks, are there areas of entertainment less publicized than others? And does an artist have a chance if they don't end up consistently blasted across social media platforms? Say the last part again. The about this does, does an artist stand a chance if they don't end up consistently blasted across social media platforms? Yes. <laughs> we want to believe. I mean, I, I would I would hope so. Um, you know, I know um, programmers in A&E, for example, have found little gems, uh, little gems that have come across their desk that are not necessary through social media. You know, somebody sends in a little clip of uh, two guys rummaging through um, artifacts in the middle of the country, you know, and before we know, we've developed a show called American Pickers. Um, you know, those kinds of things, you know, happen. Um, somebody, a programmer saw a little indie film 
um, by a, a woman who had never made a film before um, and approached her an interesting story um, and teamed her up with somebody more experienced actually. Um, and they created uh, a series on Lifetime called Unreal. Um, and you know, those kinds of things happen. You know, I think if you have a company that is open to that, um, and I know it's the culture at A&E to, to make sure that we're opening doors for people that have not told their stories before um, and get and be able to look at them and see some sort of gem there. Um, and that's, that's an art. Um, and I hope, you know, that continues. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, we had a specific question for Anna, which of, of course you can decline. You can demur, um, as all the ladies can. Um, PG and Abby to figure it out. So. There you go. Okay, they can opine. Uh, Anna, your art has always had a consciousness raising element to it, a critical consciousness about history, power, and race. I'm wondering that our audience. Uh, members wondering if you've ever considered running for and holding political office. I would be terrible. <laughs> that my first review in the New York Times was for my play Fires in the Mirror and Frank Witch suggested that I should run for office. I would be awful. I wouldn't win and I would just be terrible. I'm much better doing what I do, which is, uh, you know, I sort of am standing on the outside of the Republic and knocking on the door. Uh, that's really what I'm meant to do. I shouldn't be in the middle. Uh, well, I think we might, you might have some voters and that was, uh, thank you, Carl Young, for, uh, for asking that question. Um, a new question in, and maybe we can start with you, Gigi. Uh, what is your advice to girls who want to go into the production field in particular? Yeah, um, you know what? It's, uh, it's a great question. Um, I think, I, I've certainly had a lot of young women um, who come across uh, our company and um, and we've had multiple interns. I think, you know, you really, it's such a crowded, competitive place to be. You have to love it and it has to be the thing you want to do more than anything in the world and you can't imagine yourself doing anything else. So. To some degree, I think the advice is um, really, truly follow your deep passion because there are so many people that want to be in production. But I would also say, look at things like visual effects, look at things like emerging technologies. Um, there's a really interesting world um, of storytelling and technology. Um, you look at what The Mandalorian is doing and how John Favreau has been using technology to tell stories. Really interesting during this year of quarantine, how we were able to actually continue storytelling using technology. So I think that's an arena to really think about if that's what you're interested in. But oh boy, you gotta love it and wanna be in it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add one other thing, which is, you know, and um, Gigi and I talked about this, how we both started um, in this business, in the production business, you know, you have to start at the bottom and I see, and I, I mentor a lot of young women um, and, you know, very often it's men and women don't want to start at the bottom. They think, you know, they've got a, a degree and they're ready to be a vice president somewhere. That's not the real world. Um, I, you know, I started by answering the phone and Xeroxing scripts um, and who knew what was going to happen. Um, and so I just really encourage young people to, you know, figure out how to get yourself in and do anything, you know, even if it's, you know, mopping the floor. Um, if you really care and I, I really want to go into that business, that's how you start. That's one way to start. Yeah. Anna, what do you think? What's your advice for girls? That's exactly right. And it's, um, you know, you have to be willing to do that and do the best that you possibly can. Again, humility is my big word for the week, you know, and it's, um, it's, it's harder, I think, now, also because of how professionalized the whole thing has become. I don't know what I paid to go to acting conservatory, but I believe, I think it's true that all in NYU is like $90,000 a year. So, you know, that, that they're buying their education at a certain level. It's not their fault. 
Uh, and so, but you, you really have to be old fashioned about it and be ready to, you know, the kids who work for me are people who take it and they do a great job. And then I, I want them to come back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you all for that. And I think we have time for maybe for one last, last question. This one just in. What specific and humane ways can stories be told to stop the proliferation of environmental and social injustices in the case that these situations become even more pernicious? So I think the question is trying to get to kind of how we shape our stories to enact um, uh, social and environmental uh, justice. I don't know, Anna, I might go to back to you for that one first because I think that- I don't really know, understand the question completely, but yeah. I would say that, uh, first of all, the stories are being told in other ways. And it could be, you know, could start with that and see how you would revise it um, for whatever reason, to make it more compelling or you don't feel it's being told correctly. What, what immediately comes to mind is the trial of George, of, of, uh, of, 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 of uh, the trial of Derek Chauvin right now. Right? Right now. Yeah. That storytelling is happening right before our eyes, right? But you couldn't, it would, it would go on too long to do just what you see on TV. Is there a way that you would, how would you make that into a song? How would you make that into an opera? How would you make that into a movie that Abby might uh, get going or Gigi? How do you make it into a form that can be in intensified time, I would say? Yeah, right. How do you translate that? You know, to different ways. Um, Gigi, do you do, or Abby, do you have any thoughts on that question? Well, you know, I think. The key is about personalizing stories. Um, people respond to individual struggles, you know, conflicts, um, but it's about personalizing it. Um, and I think the more that we, you know, show um, show real life and show um, the character, you know, character development in a real way, um, that that is very powerful. And I think it has. We can't. You, it's hard to quantify how people react to that, but I do think that it influences people and changes people's perspective. Yeah, that's I, I would also say I think it was mentioned earlier, but um, you know the process of how we make these things. Do you have to work twenty three hours a day to make that show? Um, is the set inclusive? Is the set a place with humility and not fear? Um, I think that's actually a really important piece of it and not just the final product, but how we get to the final product and what the process of making this art and these stories is. Yeah, yeah, it's beautifully said, both challenging and expand, challenging this, the, the, the situations and the, the work um, of making them as well as including uh, uh, pathways for uh, not only inclusivity, but really, I think the um, the empowerment that I think that that our that that Cody Daniel is uh, Beltis is getting to. So, uh, well, thank you all so much. Uh, as with all good things, this has gone by very. This hour has gone by very quickly. The company, of course, uh, I'm giving full credit. Uh, Anna, Abby, and and Gigi, I want to thank you all so much. Uh, for being with us today, for all that you have done and continue to do. If you'd like to learn more about these three amazing women, uh, please do visit our website to read excerpts from their oral histories on our American Scene website link. We're going to put that in the chat for you. Stay tuned for more information about the forthcoming Entertainment Nation exhibition. Uh, we'll tell stories like this uh, from film, uh, television, sports, theater, and music. Uh, and until then, um, take the best of care. Uh, be good to yourselves. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll hopefully be in touch very soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.